Hello everybody and welcome to Dry Dock episode 50. So just a few small pieces of channel admin before we get into the questions at this time. So now that most of you hopefully have seen the video I did with military aviation history and military history visualized, uh, you know what I look like, but also you saw the t-shirt I was wearing. A couple of you have expressed interest in being able to purchase a similar t-shirt. So I'm happy to say that in the next week or so, I will be working on getting those available if people will like to have them. Um, uh, there'll be a link in the next dry dock, I think, once I've finished setting up that particular bit. Um, so there's that. But in addition to that, uh, you may have noticed if you're keeping an eye on the comment section that a viewer called uh, Kevin Kennelly seems to be collecting what he calls the dracisms of the day in the comments, which uh, I guess is the bits that he finds particularly amusing. Um, so I thought I'm going to try and experiment with seeing if we can have maybe come some kind of uh, drop down multiple choice box where you can choose some of the funnier ones. Um, for inclusion as on part of the t-shirt I guess to customize it or well t-shirt whatever or whatever you choose to stick the <laughs> the channel logo on um, and so yeah I will be trying to see if I can get that working um, and if not then I guess uh, when it's released I guess I'll just say well email me and I'll try and set up a customized version for you manually um, with your quote of choice but anyway, that's that's it for that, and we'll see how that goes in the next week as I struggle to try and make all that uh, online t shopping stuff work. So let's get on with uh, questions, and the questions this week come initially from the Lytha video, that's the Hungarian River Monitor, and also from the video on the Galena. So the sources used for the Galena video include uh, Warrior to Dreadnought by DK Brown, the... Dictionary of American Naval Fighting Ships, hosted by Naval History and Heritage Command, and the Osprey Union Monitor 1861 to 1865, uh, which rather confusingly also included, includes Galena, New Ironsides, and Keokuk, even though none of those are actually monitors. And the sources for the Lightha video consist of both the information actually available on the ship itself, and the... Well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce it in Hungarian, but it's a book called The Leitha Monitor and Others um, by Andres Margitai Becht. And that book is available only in Hungarian, um, which is very helpful, as I don't actually speak it. But fortunately, while I was over there, I was obviously the guest of someone who did and was they were very happy to uh, translate the relevant portions for me. So, Lady Ponfar asks, what guns were better, the Parrots or the Dahlgrens? It really depends on what you value most in your gun. The Parrot guns, or Parrot rifles, I should say, um, were much higher velocity weapons, and obviously they were also rifles, so potentially somewhat more accurate. So that would suggest that if you wanted to go in for armor piercing, you might want to take a parrot rifle with you. However, parrot rifles only went up to 10 inches, uh, albeit it was a 300 pound shot at 10 inches. Um, and they did have a disturbing tendency of exploding, which is not necessarily something you want in your rifled <laughs> artillery if you value your life. Um, they also tended to use a larger um, charge for a given size of gun, at least in the initial part of the American Civil War. The Dahlgrens, on the other hand, go up to significantly larger weapons, 15-inch um, Dahlgrens not being particularly uncommon, and uh, there was a 20-inch Dahlgren considered. Um, however... Their weight of shell is not tremendously greater. If you look at a 10-inch Dahlgren, a 10-inch Dahlgren is firing a 100-pound shot, or just over, um, whereas the 10-inch Parrot is firing a 300-pound shot, and to get above that 300-pounder that the Parrot can throw, you need the 15-inch on the Dahlgrens, and they are only 352 pounds. So Dahlgren's shorter range, um, but also much more reliable. Um, they did not have the habit of exploding, um, which was pretty much the entire reason Dahlgren invented them. Um, 
And so they're kind of more low-velocity smashing weapons. So in some ways, although the comparison isn't exactly apt, you could liken the Parrot rifles to, say, something like a heavy sniper rifle, like a 50 caliber uh, Barrett with armor-piercing rounds, whereas the Dahlgrens are basically like an, a shotgun armed with a solid slug. So different uses... Um, if you're going up against a armoured target, you probably want a parrot. If you're going up against a lightly armoured target or a wooden target or basically anything that can be smashed with relative ease, given that they are obviously still warships or fortifications, the Dahlgren's probably your go-to weapon. Personally, I would almost always go with the Dahlgren, but then that's mainly because I don't like, like 20, 25 pounds of explosive blowing up a... 12 ton cannon right next to me because I like life. Alfredo Sierra, one of the earliest subscribers, asks how the battle between Kirishima and South Dakota would have gone if Washington wasn't there to assist her. I .e. would Kirishima eventually sink South Dakota, and if so, how would it have affected US shipbuilding since they just lost a brand new battleship to a World War I battlecruiser? So, assuming that Washington isn't there but all other things remain equal, it's difficult to see how South Dakota could survive the night. Um, South Dakota was basically, in its own words, rendered deaf, blind, dumb and impotent um, due to the electrical failures and the subsequent plastering that the superstructure received. Without Washington there, the four escorting destroyers on the American side are already either sunk, sinking or ordered to withdraw because they've been too badly damaged. The Japanese still have two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, plus Kirishima, plus nine destroyers. And um, that's an awful lot of torpedoes. Now, granted, South Dakota did a very good job in not being hit by long lances uh, during that particular engagement. But without the distraction of Washington showing up and blowing Kirishima out of the water, it is just a matter of time with that many ships there The Either South Dakota's going to eat a long lance or, or more, or they're just going to keep plastering it until something breaks. Um, or the whole thing burns to the waterline, one or the other, because there's nothing else, there's no one else there to save South Dakota. Um, and by the time they manage to get the electrical systems working and pull the main armament back into shape, it's incredibly likely that pretty much everything else, including all the radar and fire control systems, are already dead anyway, along with any searchlights, so they wouldn't be able to meaningfully engage unless the Japanese do something tremendously stupid like keep all their searchlights on. Um, so yeah, inevitably, without Washington, South Dakota is going to go down, although I rather suspect it will take quite a while unless somebody gets lucky with a long lance salvo. Jorg... Pot asks, what would have been the best way to fix Galena? Um, would it just have been to convert into a normal warship as was done, or could it have been combat worthy with replacement armour, a change in hull form, or something else? So our enemy here is basically the square cube law. Um, if you increase dimensions somewhat, you increase volume significantly. Volume, obviously, it affects displacement, and so if you have a ship that's a bit larger but has significantly more volume it can therefore displace more therefore it can support a lot more armor um, after warrior and black prince were built the royal navy did try to build smaller ironclads as an economic savings measure so they could build more of them but it turns out that even on ships that were substantially larger than galena albeit smaller than warrior and black prince they couldn't quite make it work um, the, well, for one thing, the savings weren't as much as they anticipated, but also they hit a point below which it was kind of impossible to put meaningful armour on a ship without it just becoming far too overloaded. Um, obviously, monitors are a different matter because their freeboard is so low. We're talking about ships with, like, Galena or Warrior Black Prince or Defence or something that actually have freeboard you need to defend. Um, so... It's difficult to see how you could make Galena work at its size as an ironclad ship. The only thing that I can think of would be to maybe have a flash of inspiration and sort of circumvent maybe the next eight to ten years worth of uh, ship development and 
sort of proactively invent the central battery ironclad by concentrating the available weight you have for armor in the middle of the ship sort of near the machinery and then maybe just gut keeping the biggest guns in there and just having this little central armored citadel that might make the ship viable in terms of its armor will actually protect it the the parts that it covers um, obviously the ends of the ship will then be hilariously vulnerable to gunfire but that's not exactly a new thing um, as long as the central citadel is capable of keeping the ship afloat which was kind of the basis behind warrior citadel you might be all right really that's about the only thing i can think of that would allow galena to be a combat capable ironclad uh, as opposed to what they did obviously which was strip the armor off and get a relatively useful small warship out of it lauren bath asks between the wars u.s warships sported plenty of boats but during the early war years i see life rafts as world war ii progressed there seemed to be fewer and fewer life rafts visible in photographs thinking of the sinking of the indianapolis it seems most of the equipment available to most sailors for abandoning ship was life vests so why is this so the answer to the uh, apparent disappearance of major life-saving equipment is somewhat varied. S basically, it comes down to the, what you mentioned in the continuation of your question, which is that in times of war, the boats and life rafts and other life-saving equipment you have do generally mounted on the out external decks of warships doesn't tend to survive action very well. Um, and this is something of a complication because, let's face it, if you're in an armoured warship equipped with many guns, as you would be in World War II, if you're ever in a position where you need to abandon ship, outside of, well, possibly outside of being torpedoed, generally, you're going to be abandoning your heavily armoured, heavily protected warship because you've been shot to pieces by numerous armour-piercing and high-explosive shells. Now, the thing about shells exploding and sending splinters everywhere and setting everything on fire is that if enough of these have landed that your large armoured warship is in a position to sink, chances are all your completely unprotected life rafts and uh, launches are probably in little tiny burning pieces all over the ship, at which point they're not incredibly useful to you. So... Yeah, not really worth having out there, to be perfectly honest. Some of them were moved internally, especially stuff like life rafts, which could be collapsed, um, so they'd have a modicum of protection. Others were just taken out entirely because, well, they couldn't be moved undercover, and as I say, chances are, if the ship was in a position to sink, they wouldn't be much help either. In fact, they might actually have helped the ship sink, especially when you're talking about ships, boats, and launches, because, well, they're flammable and they're a fire hazard. Um... And, there, I mean, there's also a certain degree of the fact that ships start to get larger, so proportionally, if they've got similar or slightly greater amounts of external life-saving equipment still out there, it's going to look a lot less because the ship is vastly larger. And, to a certain degree, there's also recognition of the fact that, especially in the US Navy, if a ship goes down, the chances are there's going to be a lot of other ships nearby, at which point people in life jackets can be picked up relatively quickly and the flip side to that is that well if you're on your own in the middle of the pacific as per unfortunately the crew of the indianapolis the chances of any kind of life raft dash lifeboat situation actually going particularly well for you is not that great um, you just kind of starve to death or die of dehydration instead of being being eaten by sharks so yeah, I don't know which is more preferable on that count. But with that said, as I, as I mentioned just slightly earlier, it wasn't a complete deletion of the life-saving equipment. There was still a few bits and pieces out there in the vain hope they might survive, um, but there was also a bunch of safety equipment that was moved internally under some form of protection. Moving on to questions from the Lytha video, the Phantom Knight asks, which nation had the best monitor, both when ironclad ships were new and during both world wars? Well, the question there really is what kind of monitors you're looking at, because you've got the Riverine monitors, and you've got the 
coastal monitors. And to that degree, actually, later on, you also have semi-ocean going monitors, but that's uh, kind of an, just basically a coastal monitor that can actually go to an enemy coast um, under its own power relatively safely. In terms of when ironclad ships were new, um, you're probably... Well, you have to basically look at the American Navy, whether it's the Union Navy or the immediate post-war United States Navy, basically because, well, as the name suggests, they invented the monitor and they had an entire war in order to perfect it when most other people weren't actually paying that much attention to them. So, yeah, in terms of both Riverine and dedicated coastal monitors, the US Navy definitely had the advantage there. When it comes to fully ocean-going monitors, it's debatable. The US Navy did eventually come up with some monitors that could safely traverse the oceans. At the same time, a number of European navies also developed what they call breastwork monitors, which were effectively coastal monitors with temporary pop-up, uh, as the name suggests, breastworks, in order to increase their freeboard for ocean-going travel. And some of those ships were considerably more capable than some of the American monitors, largely use, using the fact that they were equipped with slightly better main battery guns. But there weren't that many of them, and to be perfectly honest, um, they weren't quite as agile or as useful actually in close confined coastal waters because of the design considerations needed to get the ships to make it overseas. So I wouldn't really be able to call it on the larger ones there. Obviously you do have river on monitors in Europe like the Leitha and uh, various Austro-Hungarian so Austro and Russian river monitors and various other countries in Europe. Um, but the development of those scattered throughout sort of the late 1860s onwards is a little bit all over the place and, as discussed in the Lytha video, influenced to a very great degree by the kind of rivers they were having to operate on, so it's a little bit unfair to compare them because an American river ride monitor designed to operate on the Mississippi, for example, would practically be useless on the Danube because it would probably run aground horribly, whereas something like the Lytha would be able to operate perfectly well on the Danube but would be considered definitely underarmed and underprotected if it was going to go on any of the broader American rivers and try and fight there. Now in terms of the two world wars, that much was pretty much an open and shut case. It, you've got to go with the British, at least for coastal and ocean going monitors, largely because they were the only people who bothered to build them at all or in any great quantity, depending on which other navy you're looking at in comparison. So they kind of win by default in that on that basis, and by that point, when you look when you're looking at river run monitors again, the similar considerations I mentioned earlier apply. Um, so yeah, during the two world wars, you probably the fourteen and fifteen inch gun monitors that the British had would be considered the best ones, uh, at least in terms of firepower. Um, but there were a whole range of them. So yeah, the field fields when you're discussing monitors you're usually very limited either by the fact that at any given time there's very very few people building any particular type of monitor and the only ones that there are considerable numbers built of across many, multiple countries are riverine ones and as i said yeah you can't really make a judgment call between them because of the operational conditions they're designed for bene hirsch asks do you like hungarian food Yes, I actually find Hungarian food by and large quite appetising, and that was one of the major plus points of going to Hungary, plus the fact that food is actually relatively cheap compared to the extortionate prices you pay in UK restaurants. It's kind of a double whammy of, well, I get to go to a place and I pay less for the food, and the food is of better quality. About the only downside of it is that I had to force myself to walk most places in Budapest rather than take public transport, because otherwise I would probably have put on five kilos from the amount of Hungarian delicacies I was shoveling down my throat. Because, uh, well, if you're only there for a few days, take advantage of what you can. General Vikas asks... You've often said that aircraft did not become a serious threat to capital ships until at least the late 1930s. But even in the in early interwar period, there were carriers, aerial torpedoes, etc. 
whilst one would expect carrier aviation to be less effective tactically and technically than it was in World War II, anti-aircraft defences were also less extensive. What were the limiting factors that prevented air power from becoming a decisive element in naval warfare in those early years, and how were they overcome? So the answer to this is a somewhat multifaceted question, or multifaceted answer, I should say. Um, yes, anti-aircraft defences were also less extensive, but aircraft themselves were vastly less capable. Um, one of the things that made anti-aircraft defence so difficult in the initial part of World War II was that aircraft speeds took a quantum leap in the mid to late 1930s. And prior to that, you're looking at aircraft speeds where actually the lack of significant major fire control systems wasn't a problem because you're still operating at speeds where manual aiming and leading is actually a viable method of defense. Obviously, you don't have as many anti-aircraft guns, but that leads into another thing, which is there just weren't that many aircraft carriers. Um, I mean, if you look at the two biggest navies in the world, you had the British with Hermes, Eagle, uh, Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. So you had sort of, well, I don't know exactly how you classify Eagle. I'd say probably one small, one medium, and three medium to large capacity carriers, with Ark Royal coming online a bit later in that period up until the mid-30s. And in America, you've got Langley, for all the good that is, um, Saratoga, obviously, and Lexington. And that's pretty much it. Even Ranger isn't coming into commission until the mid-30s. Um, and likewise in Japan, you've got Hosho, um, Akagi, uh, Kaga, and Ruggio. And that's it. So there's not actually that many aircraft carriers around which means that the actual flight groups and the number of aircraft that can be deployed is significantly less. Because when you take into account that at least one of those ships in each navy is probably going to be in for maintenance at any given time, and you probably don't want to put your entire carrier task force into one particular basket, you may be looking at one, maybe two decks worth of uh, aircraft, which isn't a tremendous amount. Um, they've also got, with the limitations of the aircraft, apart from the speed, their carrying capacity is less, so the, the bombs that they can carry are significantly um, lighter, torpedoes are smaller, less capable. You've also got to take into account their range, obviously, is less. Their ability to navigate is significantly less. Um, there's not kind of radio homing or anything, um, and you're not going to be doing night operations in the mid to late 1920s with aircraft, I can guarantee that much. Um, so yeah, the, the aircraft are a major limiting factor. It's kind of like they can't reach out that far. When they do reach, finally find an enemy, there's not going to be that many of them. When they actually launch an attack, they're not carrying particularly dangerous weapons. Their accuracy is going to be pretty abysmal. And assuming that they do hit, the weapons themselves probably aren't going to do tremendous amounts of damage to anything that's particularly heavily armoured. Then on top of all of that, you have the additional factor, which is um, often overlooked, which is related to the speed of the aircraft, which is the amount of warning the enemy fleet can get. One of the major driving factors between various carrier designs and carrier tactics in the mid to late 30s, as carriers became a truly uh, major threat to capital ships, was with the increasing speed of aircraft, you could spot them coming over the horizon or maybe with a picket, but by the time you'd actually scrambled all your defences, got into formation, if you weren't in anti-aircraft defence formation, launched fighters from your own carriers, etc., the enemy would already be on top of you. Which was one of the reasons um, why getting air search radar aboard ships was a particular priority, for especially for carriers. Now, if you're looking before the mid to late 1930s when aircraft are a lot slower, you can spot a strike coming and you have pretty much all the time in the world to get ready to receive it. Um, obviously, I say your, your, your anti-aircraft fire pack is limited, but you can get what fighters you yourself have up into the air. And you're also still, for a significant portion of that period, in a position where there's a kind of turret-mounted fighters that showed up towards the end of World War One are still viable combat aircraft. 
Um, so you, you can actually launch a surprising number of fighters to counter the um, incoming uh, enemy if you look at the proportional balance of fighters versus bombers uh, and torpedo planes. So, yeah, there, there's that additional complicating factor. So all these things between them mitigate against aircraft being especially effective against a mobile fleet that's capable of defending itself. Um, sure, they might damage ships, but they're not going to be any. They're not going to put them down on their own. And to be honest, the single most vulnerable ship that you can go for is probably the enemy's carrier force. So if the two, if the carrier forces negate each other, it's like oh well, back to World War One battle line tactics then. Um, and the way it was overcome, as I say, was basically advances in technology, faster, more capable aircraft meant less warning, longer range. Advances in technology meant you could navigate further and vaguely reliably get back to your own ships. Um, the weapons that the aircraft could carry could be delivered faster through the teeth of defences, and when they hit, they were a lot more capable. And the proliferation of carrier hulls with um, things like the Chicago class, the Yorktown class, and the Illustrious class meant that there were just more aircraft around, um, more carriers around, and therefore it's more, A, more likely that you'd be attacked by carrier aircraft, and B, if you were, chances are there's going to be a lot more of them, and the weapons they carry are going to do a serious amount of damage to you. Wesley El Ellisdale asks, Which ship, in your opinion, deserves the title for longest-range hit in naval history, war spite fitting Julio Cesare, or Scharnhorst for hitting HMS Glorious? Honestly, I would not be able to give an opinion on this question, largely because the range involved in both hits is remarkably similar, um, being 26,000 yards and a little bit. By Scharnhorst's own account, the range at the time that it scores a hit on Glorious is probably around 26,400 yards, give or take. And the range from Warspite to Julio Cesare was pretty much, yeah, 26,000 yards and a little bit more. Um, and the difference between the best guess estimate for the two based on, uh, for both ranges based on uh, the reports given by the ships are so close that it's within the margin of error for range finding systems of the time to say it could be one or the other. Um, it, it's about as close to a dead heat tie as you can possibly get in the realms of naval gunnery. XX Night Driver XX says, you said in the last couple of videos, uh, one on Strasdavoy and another about a US ship, that long barrels make anti-aircraft guns less efficient in the anti-aircraft role. Uh, the examples were between Strasdavoy's main guns and the US 5-inch 38 caliber weapon. Why is that? Since it would seem to me that a longer barrel equals higher muzzle velocity, which should make it easier to hit aircraft at long range. It's a bit of a quandary, especially when you consider that when you're talking about land-based anti-aircraft guns, you definitely want a nice long barrel in general when you're talking about things like, say, the Flak 88. Now, the reason I say that a shorter barrel weapon is perhaps better for anti-aircraft use when we're talking about the sort of interwar and World War II navies comes down to a number of factors. Firstly, a shorter barrel weapon is a much lighter weapon, which means you can get more of them on a given ship. And in an era when anti-aircraft fire is more about barrage fire, you just need to throw up the biggest wall of lead you possibly can. Um, if you've got more weapons, you can throw up more shrapnel, which means you're more likely to hit. But that lighter weight also translates into a number of other things. It also means that you're probably using uh, smaller charges and therefore less recoil, which means that the guns can be ready to fire again a lot quicker. So again, you're throwing out more shells. Um, they can also be trained on the enemy aircraft a lot faster because, again, lighter weight, therefore for the same power on your training motors or your hydraulics or whatever it is you're using to aim the gun, you can slew them around a lot faster, which means your tracking is significantly better. Also, because of the lower weight and lesser recoil, it means that you don't need to mount them either as high off the deck or, or with as deep a pit in the deck, depending on the kind of mounting you're using, in order to elevate the guns higher, which makes it easier and less complicated to ensure that you have high angle fire which is very important for close in air defense 
uh, which is one of the major drawbacks of the longer barrel weapons, uh, especially on smaller ships like cruisers and destroyers, is the fact that they generally usually can't actually elevate high enough to engage once the enemy aircraft are in close range. So yeah, basically, in short, for the interwar and early to mid-World War II period, a shorter barrel weapon like a 5-inch 38 caliber can be trained faster, elevated faster, it can fire faster, and it can fire at a higher angle, and you can fit more of them onto a ship, which basically makes them superior anti-aircraft weapons. That's true on large ships, but it's especially true on destroyers, where you're going to have a very limited number of anti-aircraft guns, so you need to really be able to put out as many shells as possible, as quickly as possible, from the guns that you have available. Now, towards the end of the war, as fire control systems start to get even better than the mid-war, and you have a much more widespread radar pro guidance, as well as power training, then the power training takes over from uh, other systems, which means that your speed of training can be a lot faster even though you've got a heavier gun um, and the fact that you've got good fire control systems backed up by radar means that you can actually aim the shells specifically to go take out aircraft as opposed to firing in the general direction of the aircraft and hope something in the barrage hits at which point having longer barrel anti-aircraft weapons on ships starts to make a lot more sense and this is why when you look at things like the dual purpose guns on the Worcester, the six inch guns there, and the 5.25 inches uh, turrets that are fitted on Vanguard, as opposed to the ones on King George V, all of a sudden these longer barrel weapons are now more efficient than the five inch 38 because of, as you said, the additional range and shorter flight time of the shells. But it requires significant advances in the power training and fire control systems and aiming of the guns themselves in order for that to become effective. Woody Carlyle asks, with the advanced anti-aircraft batteries on the Bismarck, how is it that they were unable to shoot down any of the swordfish torpedo bombers? Well, I could go on and on about this, but effectively, uh, military history visualizers covered this in a fair amount of detail uh, already, so I'd strongly recommend having a look at his video um, on the subject. Uh, that was also in the video on Operation Reinebung that this question is taken from that was linked during the section on the swordfish attacks. Effectively, I'd just say, uh, as a very brief summary, the swordfish was so hilariously obsolete, it kind of looped all the way around the circle and came back to being good again, with one of the major factors being that, well, the thing was made of canvas and wood and piano wire, effectively, which meant that a tremendous amount of um, fire that would have otherwise shredded a modern aircraft and sent it plunging out of control just went straight through it and out the other side and left little holes where the swordfish like, oh, well, there's a hole, I guess we're, out of, we're down to stitching things back together tonight. And that was about it. But as I say, have a look at military history, military history, uh, military history visualized video on the subject um, as it covers this in a lot more detail. Long Lake Shaw says, or asks rather, are you saying that eyewitnesses reported they saw 16-inch rounds from Rodney passing all the way through Bismarck through both armour belts? That seems highly unlikely even at point-blank range. So the answer comes in two parts. Yes, uh, officers and men on the Rodney did report visually tracking shells from Rodney's main guns that punched straight through the Bismarck and out the other side, as in they saw the shell enter, they saw the shell leave, they saw the shell hit the water on the far side of the ship, um, and with the resulting destruction on the way through. However, no, that wasn't shells punching straight through Bismarck's main armour belt twice. You've got to bear in mind that um, the main armour belt of a battleship actually covers surprisingly small amounts of the ship's hull above the water, um, when you look at it in terms of percentage area, and on top of that, you've got the superstructure. So uh, even in addition to that, you've also got to remember that the Bismarck's armor belt was not completely just under 13 inches thick, top to bottom. You had the main armor belt, which was, let's say, just under 13 inches thick, but it then had an upper strake of armor, which was part of the main belt, but was considerably thinner. Um, and then you had even above that, uh, 
what was effectively unarmored hull and then superstructure. So given when the wreck was examined that the vast majority of hits are on either that upper strake or above, I suspect what the survivor well survivors what the crew of the Rodney were witnessing and what they're reporting was the shells punching through that either that upper strake or the upper hull or the superstructure and coming out the other side, which is all still part of the Bismarck. Because um, one of the other things you've got to remember is Bismarck was already um, listing and down somewhat by the start of the battle, and by the time Rodney had closed in to the point that they could actually track things that closely, it would have been a case of probably a significant portion of the main armour belt, the sort of just under 13-inch belt, being at or just below the waterline, so uh, most of the exposed hull at that point probably would have been, uh, as you say, either less protected or not protected at all. Beedrillbot121 asks, What if Yamato had survived? Would it have met the same fate as Nagato, or would it have been kept as a war prize? Um, and what is your opinion of the US Super Heavy 18-inch shell? Okay, so if somehow Yamato had survived the war, somewhat similar to Nagato, I can see the Americans using it in an atom bomb test, just because. I mean, there's not a tremendous amount of use for it in their own fleet. They're hardly going to commission it as USS Yamato. Um, I guess there may be a certain percentage in possibly using it as a museum ship, as... as maybe kind of some kind of glorious trophy assuming it's in a condition to make it back across the uh, Pacific but even then um, the kind of museum battleships thing doesn't really become a thing for quite a while after the war and uh, well um, it's going to take a, quite a bit of money to keep this thing around <laughs> long enough for that to survive. So yeah, I think it, it quite possibly could have ended up as an atomic bomb test target, although there is a small possibility they might have hauled it over to the US as a kind of war trophy, and um, maybe it would still be around as a museum ship today. Who knows? Now, as far as the super heavy, a I'm presuming you mean 16-inch shell, because... The US didn't put an 18-inch shell into combat, let alone a super heavy one. Uh, my personal opinion is divided somewhat on the Mark 8 uh, super heavy shell. On the one hand, yes, it does give superior deck protection, uh, deck penetration. That is very true. On the other hand, it is kind of the ultimate expression of the US Navy's obsession with extremely long-range naval gunfire. Which, in the case of the actual Crucible of War, really wasn't borne out. It, I'd almost go so far as to call it a failed naval doctrine. Because if, well, aside from incidents like Scharnhorst and Warspite, pretty much all battleship gunfights had minimal to no hits at long range and always sought to close the range to medium or short range as quickly as possible. At which point even a super heavy shell is going to be... Um, hitting the side armor of a ship so yeah I, I as a doctrine i don't think the whole super heavy shells for long range deck penetration is really a viable thing um and so in that respect you i i kind of view them as something of a failure and i definitely think for something like the iowa's at the kind of effective ranges that you could reach with an iowa's gun if you'd given it a more standard shell and fired it from the 16 inch 50s you would have had like almost railgun levels of penetration uh, much like the italian 15 inch guns actually with the 16 inch 45s on the south dakotas on them i can see a certain amount of utility for the super heavy shell because it had that lower muzzle velocity, which means that it gets the drop and the increased deck penetration at closer ranges where you're more likely to hit, period. Um, so I can't write it off entirely. But I do think that certainly it's, it's, it's nowhere near as much of a game changer or a ship killer, etc. as it's sometimes made out to be. Um, basically because the primary users of that shell would have been the Iowa class, and pretty much, as I said, in my personal opinion, at any kind of practical battle range where you can expect an Iowa to land hits reliably, you'd probably be better off just slinging a, a slightly more regular weight shell at insane velocities, um, 
the the super heavy shells slightly lower penetration due to lower velocity is basically compensated for on the Iowas by the fact that it's a 16 inch 50 caliber gun but the words compensated for are not necessarily ones you want to have when you're dealing with your naval guns now on to the discord questions Krager asks was the increased cost and production time for ironclads and then battleships the principal na reason that navies seemed so reluctant to engage each other after the age of sail so yes but it also has to do with the fact that there were quite a lot of naval reset buttons slammed between the 1860s and the 1960s which limited the size of fleets now, if you remember in the HMS Victory video, I mentioned that first-rate ships of the line could have extraordinarily long uh, active combat careers uh, with periods spent in reserve, and the same was true for most other major warships um, of the Age of Sail era, and the fact that they could just be a lot of them built. Um, because they didn't tend to sink that easily, because wood naturally floats, so yeah, you might capture them, recapture them, etc., but... It wasn't that common um, for ships in battle to actually be sunk. It was a relatively rare event. It would be far more likely for you to lose a ship like that in a storm or to a navigation error, error for example. So this meant that, combined with the relatively slow speed and relative lack of long-distance communications in any kind of realistic time frame, in the age of sail, you could have hundreds if not thousands of ships in your fleet if you go all the way down to include things like sloops and brigs and they could be in squadrons dispersed all over the planet and yeah if one of them fought win or lose it might affect your local um tactical situation there but the overall strategic situation unless it was a really major fleet battle might not change that much and the simple fact was that because of the longevity of the ships, you could build up a fairly substantial fleet um, and then replace it um, relatively consistently, uh, or at least replace losses. The French, for example, after the Battle of Trafalgar, a significant portion of their active ship of the line fleet was lost. But if you look through the naval engagements of the Royal Navy from 1805 to 1815, there's consistently operations either to blockade, capture or destroy multiple French ships of the line. The, most of those ships of the line didn't exist in 1805. They were built whilst under blockade, and effectively the French were just respawning fleets, and the British were constantly camping them, trying to effectively spawn camp the French fleet out of existence. Whereas once you get to the 1860s, everything you've built up, that massive legacy fleet, is gone. Um, in terms of, sort of being frontline combat effective. SMS Kaiser aside, um, which then means that the margin of superiority is going to be significantly less because, um, let's say, in the 1820s, the Royal Navy's margin of superiority over everyone else was so massive in terms of numbers that they could afford to fight a war or two with almost anybody. And it was a case of, well, yeah, win, win or lose an individual battle, doesn't matter, we're still coming out vastly ahead of everyone else on ships. Whereas by the time you get to the 1860s, 1870s and the Ironclad era, all and obviously thereafter, you're suddenly looking at, well, yes, we might outnumber our nearest enemy, but we might only outnumber our nearest enemy by 40-60%. Um, although obviously the British later did try and go up to the two-power standard of, of um, outnumbering their two closest rivals by two to one or more. Um but because those numbers were so much closer and the actual numbers themselves were so much slower, it meant that if you suffered a single major defeat, and bear in mind you're much more likely to then lose ships rather than just have them defeated and returned to port damaged, you would end up in a situation where the force available to your fleet has been so significantly reduced that either your opponent now has a decisive advantage or other enemies who might not have got involved in the conflict initially now might be tempted to because they think they've got a, ch a fair chance at cracking what's left of your fleet. That is not a good situation to be in. So that's why all of a sudden you start to see a much more reluctance for the various fleets of the world to engage in major fleet actions. And as I said, there's also the reset buttons because you've got the rise of the ironclads with Gla and Warrior and the 
everyone takes uh, sort of people are taking the lead in that obviously the royal navy mainly um but then you get to the turreted central battery ironclads and the turreted ironclads like say hms devastation that almost puts a, a hard stop on previous uh ship development something like warrior or monarch um uh, actually no monarch does have turrets but something like warrior um is not really seen as a frontline combat unit once Devastation and Thunder are out. And that's only about a decade afterwards. So uh, now you're back to square one. And then you build up again. And then, oh, look, here come the Majestics. Now you've got the pre-dreadnoughts, the classic pre-dreadnoughts. So they're superior to all the Ironclads. And you're back at square one again. Then you've got the Dreadnoughts. You're back at square one again. Then you've got the uh, the post-treaty, uh, the, the, the treaty-era battleships at 35,000 tons and... They're generally, um, outside of one or two cases, generally superior to the World War One era ships. So rather than being in a situation where your Navy f might have ships that are pushing a century old and can pretty much lay claim to every ship they've built since then as an effective combatant, you're looking at, well, what has your nation built in the last decade or two? That's all you've got. So... That means, as I say, your, your margin of superiority and your total numerical fleet strength is much, much lower when it comes to serious capital units, which then means that a defeat is going to be a much more catastrophic event, which you obviously desperately want to avoid. So hopefully, um, I know that was a little bit repetitive, but hopefully that gives you some idea of the logistics behind why all of a sudden, uh, in the age of steam and steel, people got very reluctant to push for a major fleet battle. Drylander asks, would it be legal dash possible to turn a modern barge into a warship by simply putting a brick on it that contains missile sensors dash most of the crew, etc.? Um, kind of? I mean, a barge is a barge. I mean, you could turn a barge into a floating surface-to-air missile battery if you had a sort of a big shipping container with a self-contained surface-to-air missile pack and radar unit. I mean, that's entirely doable. Um, legally, as long as you commission it as some form of warship and it's part of your navy, then sure, go for it. Um, if you want to keep it as a merchant ship, like an armed merchant raider or a Q-ship or something like that, um, international laws got a little bit stricter on those kind of things since the world wars and the age of privateering. Um, so, yeah, legally, yes, but only if you commission it into your navy. Um, otherwise you'll face fairly large legal issues. Although, to be fair, if you're reduced to the point of arming merchant ships, you're probably less likely to be worrying about the legal niceties of international politics. Um, I mean, in, if you want to scale up the concept, there's obviously the perennial uh, worries, fears, dash proposals about turning cargo ships, cargo container ships, into mass missile batteries just by sticking a bunch of hidden surface-to-surface -surface missile launchers and a few sensors in them. So, yeah, again, it's yes, it's kind of possible to do so, but it it kind of it comes back to the, a similar kind of point that I like to make about the Japanese hybrid aircraft carriers and hybrid aircraft carriers as a concept in general, which is, yes, you can do it. However, if you're in the circumstances where you need to do it, you probably are, have a lot more problems to worry about than whether or not you can jury-rig some kind of one-shot warship out of a cargo ship. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, well, if you're falling out of uh, an aircraft and you pull the parachute ripcord and the parachute doesn't open and then you discover that your phone has fallen out of your pocket on the way down, it's like, yes, okay, that's a problem. Your phone might be worth a several hundred, maybe even a thousand dollars. But you have much bigger problems to worry about at this point. Life Beyond Living asks, what would the impact have been of a zero-sum Denmark Strait? Which is basically a Denmark Strait battle where everybody involved is sunk. It depends greatly on the circumstances, to be honest. Um, I mean, there'd be a lot of confused head-scratching as to how a battleship and a heavy cruiser took down um, what were effectively the Royal Navy's largest battleship and their most modern battleship. On the other hand, I guess they would have thought taking out the Bismarck might have been worth the trade. Probably not, to be honest. There'd be a lot of questions for the captains of Norfolk and Suffolk as to what the hell went on. Um, in the scenario Life Beyond Living describes, 
uh, it effectively rules out kind of golden BB magazine explosions and basically Prince Eugen goes down then Hood is slowly battered into submission then eventually Bismarck goes down having taken extensive damage from Hood and Prince of Wales whilst it's battering Hood and then Prince of Wales um, basically succumbs to cumulative damage and uh, ends up being scuttled by the destroyers when it show when they show up so yeah that kind of well the the, the main impact long term is because let's face it Prince Eugen didn't do a tremendous amount of note afterwards other than being part of the channel dash which could have been pulled off by Sean Horst and Gneiser now regardless um the main impact of it all would be that well the Royal Navy is now down two capital ships as a result of a Bismarck sortie, including its newest one, instead of uh, just the one, which means that it's highly unlikely that Force said is probably going to be sent at all because the Royal Navy can't then now can't spare the capital ships. Um, it's also going to lead to probably a radical rethink of how ships are protected because this kind of incremental damage uh, which is pretty much actually how ships like Musashi and Bismarck herself went down um, would mean that certain aspects of ship protection would they would try to boost significantly in order to try and make sure the ships stay afloat um, but yeah I think the, the overall impact of something like that without the dramatic explosion of Hood would probably result in a lot less um, frantic scrambling immediately afterwards to strengthen um, the surviving ships on both sides and make modifications there thereof. Um, of course, and of course you've got the fact that with both Bismarck and Prince Eugen out of the fight so quickly, that might actually deter Hitler from... Uh, allowing further Kriegsmarine operations even earlier, which might actually curtail Kriegsmarine operations um, in terms of surface warships quite badly. Um, I suspect you probably just see an immediate switch over to Norway, um, yeah, and, and that pretty much be it for, uh, for that. The only other sort of butterfly from that would be that Probably one, Vanguard would not be as delayed as it was. There'd probably be a scramble to complete Vanguard to try and make up for the capital ship numbers. And there's also even a possibility that they might restart work on one or both of the Lion class. Um, because if you've got Hood and Prince of Wales out of action, um, the Royal Navy now needs to come up with capital ships and fast to meet all of its obligations. Because um, historically, obviously, Bismarck went down anyway. Um, and Prince Eugen isn't a capital ship, which means that, strategically speaking, as I say, apart from not doing force said, the Royal Navy is now down a major capital unit in order to counter Tirpitz. And if they're looking at a situation where, okay, maybe even two on one odds aren't quite enough, um, when you're talking about battleship versus battleship, they're going to want more and bigger capital ships really, really quickly. Ocha asks, what would have happened if Tirpitz had been available and had sortied instead of Scharnhorst for the Battle of the North Cape? Well, it would have been a very different Battle of the North Cape, to say the least. Um, this is because the force that was set up to trap Scharnhorst was specifically calibrated to be able to overwhelm that particular ship. Because, well... They knew Turpitz was out of action at that point, thanks to earlier in the year, the uh, midget submarines, the British X-Craft, having basically disabled Turpitz with their saddle charges. So they knew Bist uh, they knew Turpitz wasn't part of the equation. And so, as I say, they, they calibrated their force to deal with the only German capital ship that what could sortie, which would have been Scharnhorst. If Turpitz had been available, then let's say the X-Craft attack didn't come off properly, the British would have obviously known that that was the case, and the forces available, they probably would have still would have tried a similar kind of trap, but if you look at some of the convoy escort forces that were put together whilst uh, Tirpitz was known to be around, i.e. like carriers, a couple of battleships, etc., there would have been a much heavier escort force, 
Now, given the weather um, that was that took place around that time, I don't think necessarily the carriers would have had that much effect. But you would have had a much stronger destroyer and cruiser escort with the convoy itself, and the f the catching force, the sort of fast force with the historically had Duke of York, would have had at least two battleships in it. Um, so there would have been a a very very different battle. And as to exactly how it went, um, who knows? With I mean, with the weather as bad as it was, and so many ships. Um, suffering either radar malfunctions or radar losses due to lucky hits quite how that would play out is not something i could come up with off the top of my head i'd have to try and war game it out a few times and uh, deleted user for the last question i have no idea who this person was but let us know in the comments if this was you um says had there been only a washington naval treaty but never a london naval treaty which now spared ships do you think could have been of any degree useful during the Second World War, uh, such as Iron Dukes, Tiger, Wyoming, etc.? Now, the interesting thing about this scenario is, actually, I don't think some of those older ships will be around in World War II, but it means that the battleship Building Holiday expires in the early 1920s, it also means that the naval limitations are purely based around displacement, uh, 525,000 tons specifically, and gun calibre not exceeding 16 inches. Um, I mean, on a separate line outside of your question, there's also the fact that cruisers are restricted only by having um, up to 10 8-inch guns and... Uh, 10,000 ton displacement, which means we may not actually see the rise of the light cruiser. We might still do with the development of rapid firing uh, main battery six inch guns, but I suspect a lot more cruisers without that heavy cruiser limitation, there might be a lot more eight inch gun cruisers around. But to focus on the capital ships, which was the main uh, focus of your question, the Iron Dukes and the Tigers are still around for the Royal Navy by the time the Washington Treaty expires. However, with that treaty expiring, there are going to be people building a lot of new battleships, and they're going to be, well, 35,000 ton 16-inch ships. So you're going to see something along the lines of maybe a North Carolina, maybe a South Dakota, um, obviously slightly earlier variants thereof. Um, the British, well, the Lion class as designed was over the treaty limits in because it was an escalator clause design um so you might see them try and pull something like a slightly less miniaturized g3 out um a some sort of improved variant on the nelsons so with everyone trying to do that and bear in mind with like with 16 inch gun ships coming out that means that the 12 inch and 13.5 inch ships are really really at a major disadvantage so i suspect that rather than keep them around for world war ii i think you're going to see the iron duke scrapped and their combined tonnage probably buys the royal navy another couple of uh battle 35,000 ton battleships if tiger goes as well which is entirely possible because the Royal Navy would be highly attracted to having a near enough uniform 15 inch battle line. You might see them, I think you might well see the Royal Navy get rid of all of their 13.5 inch gunships in exchange for rolling out, say, three, three 35,000 ton uh, ships with 16 inch guns to respond to what everybody else is doing. Uh, so you might see. The, the the or the rise of a slightly truncated battleship race, I would say, because the Americans are going to do the same kind of thing. I I rather suspect as well. Um, so yeah, but the 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 big elephant in the room there is obviously the Great Depression. The fact that nobody actually has any real money in the beginning of the nineteen thirties to actually pay for any of this. Um, so they. Which, to be honest, is kind of one of the major reasons why the London Naval Treaty actually managed to get pulled off. But assuming it somehow doesn't, I think by the time of World War Two, you probably would have seen what we historically saw as the King George V and the North Carolinas 
starting to come into service, but with 15 or 16 inch weapons in probably triple turrets, um, as per some of the design sketches for those respective ships and other similar vessels. Uh, the Japanese had a whole weird and wonderful range of ship designs to choose from at that point, um, and they probably would have picked one of those out uh, for their own schemes, which rather ironically theoretically actually puts the Allied navies in a much better position going forward. Um, I mean, the Americans still have the massive numerical and industrial advantage over the Japanese going into World War II, um, but particularly in the European theatre, rather than facing off against Bismarck with either older ships or the King George V's, you might well see some King George V variant, we say, with triple fifty modern modern triple fifteens, um, or possibly some kind of slightly sub lion variant facing off against Bismarck, which also having been started earlier and therefore completed earlier, they'd actually be in full active service. So Hood would probably be off getting its refit, and Battle of the Denmark Strait will probably consist of. Uh, well, for lack of a better term, since World of Warships kind of did this design, let's call it the Monarch, two Monarchs versus Bismarck and Prince Eugen. So, yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the, the, the older 13.5-inch sh ships and the 12-inch ships would have survived, but I think we would have had some rather interesting 15-inch um, and 16-inch treaty battleships uh, floating around in relatively large numbers. And that wraps us up for this week's episode of The Dry Dock. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, uh, comments in the comment below. And uh, yes, if uh, in particular reference to the channel admin bit at the beginning, if you would like me to try and come up with a range of dracisms of the day to stick on to various t-shirts and merch that some people apparently want, um, then please let me know in the comments and I will be happy to provide as best I can. Other than that, thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you again in another video.